turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 23. While you turn there, it's, uh, it's interesting. My, my kids went through one or two phases uh, where they, they, they started speaking to us in movie quotes. You know, we would be talking and they would say something, and I think, what was that? And then I, after a while, I figured out, oh, they're actually quoting lines from movies, from films. And uh, it seems like people like movie quotes. You know? yeah. It's uh, quite a popular thing. So uh, I thought I'll do a little quiz here and see, see how our uh, movie knowledge is. So, uh, this is... Okay, so uh, Snow White. Yeah. Who's that there? Pardon? <laughs> mirror, mirror against the wall. Is that what on the, on the wall? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Yeah, that's what that's what that's what everybody tends to say. But actually, if you go and look at the movie, it is magic mirror on the wall. But it's funny how people just sort of change it. You know, it's like oh, that doesn't sound so great. It sounds better if you say mirror, mirror on the wall. <laughs> so. Good try, but uh, 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 all of us are wrong, including myself. So here's another another famous uh, one. What does Darth Vader tell uh, Luke during that awkward family moment? I am your father. Sorry, what is that? Wrong voice. Luke, I am your father. Is that right? Something like that. Oh, now he's now he's not too sure. He says, no, I am your father. He doesn't say, Luke, I am your father. He's responding to Luke that said, you killed my father. And then he says, no, I am your father. So here's another one that may show your age. But I don't know. Another thing that my kids sometimes surprise me is... Uh, you know, there was a phase where everything we like was old and ancient and so yesterday. And then suddenly this retro thing came. Everything we liked. And they liked my old clothes and Lidl's old clothes from 20 years ago and 30 years ago. And uh, so they started liking our music. I'm like, what's wrong with today's teenagers? And... Uh, so maybe, maybe you know this movie, Dirty Harry. Who knows Dirty yeah, Harry? No, yes. Yeah. So, what's that? Okay, so what's, the, what's one of the quotes from Dirty Harry? Go ahead, my day. Go ahead, my, my day. What's another one? I'll be back. Yeah, that, that, that Dirty Harry. No, not that Dirty Harry. Is it that one? Do you feel lucky, punk? That's what most people, that's sort of the common one. It says, oh yeah, do you feel lucky, punk? Actually, that's not the full quote. He says, you've got to so ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> so, uh, I don't want to insult everybody, but I thought I would abbreviate that slightly for the title of today's sermon. And uh, just reduce it back to ask yourself, do I feel lucky? You can all add the punk bit yourself if you, if you feel like it. But, uh, I don't see any punks here today, so just ask yourself, do I feel lucky? I regularly get an email telling me how lucky I am. My name has been referred by some trustworthy person, uh, about some rich guy in Africa who died, and now his wife needs my help to move some hidden millions out of Africa. I'm like, wow, how lucky can I be to get an email like that? If only I had the time to actually respond to it and do all the you know, paperwork and send the money. And... But actually, you know, every time I get a mail like that, I think that's not as unreasonable as you think. You know, we spent uh, eight years in Namibia, and uh, Namibia is in Africa for those who don't know. Uh, and it's a Typical African country, and uh, that was eight, six plus two, eight years ago that we left Namibia, and uh, I have some funds there, which uh, I had my own business. I was doing freelance consulting while uh, while leading the church there, and eight years later, I still can't get my money out of the country. 
Uh, in fact, just about a month ago, I had another letter from my accountant with an invoice saying, okay, we've, we're at about step three of step uh, four or five or six to actually get all your accounts closed and get it all finished up so you can actually get your money out. So I can understand that it's hard to get money out of Africa. I, I've experienced it myself. <laughs> so I get a mail like that and I think, oh, I'm lucky. Sometimes life happens. Life happens to us. You know, unexpected events disrupt life or interrupt our lives even. And sometimes it happens and we think like, wow, I'm so lucky. Like uh, one year in Namibia, Lisa and myself won tickets to the Rugby World Cup in Paris with flights and hotel and pre-match hospitality and meeting the 95 uh, World Cup winners before the time. And I was like, wow, how lucky can I be? And then there was another time where we were living in Amsterdam, we bought some airline tickets to go and visit family in South Africa through an airline called Alafrikia from uh, Libya. And about two weeks before we were about to fly, all uh, civil war broke out in Libya. They bombed the place, the airline shut down, and we lost our tickets and our money. And we feel like, man, how unlucky can I be? And we, these things happen. Life happens, and then we sort of tend to think I am lucky or I am unlucky. So we're going to just have a look at some events around the crucifixion today and ask about some of these people. Is he a lucky guy? Or maybe not? We'll start off with, in Luke 23 verse 26, with uh, Simon of Cyrene. Luke 23 verse 26. It says, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Here's this guy, Simon of Cyrene, in Jerusalem. He's from Africa, also from modern day uh, Tripoli in Libya. He was just visiting, he was just passing by, and he was just happened to be in the wrong place, in the wrong time, and they say, you, come and carry this man's cross. I can just imagine him like, him, no, no, sorry, you've got the wrong guy. I'm not from here, I'm just visiting. <laughs> it's a bit like sometimes when I evangelize in London, people say, oh, no, 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 sorry, no, thank you, I'm not from here. I'm just visiting. And he was just in the wrong place in the wrong time. And it seemed like, oh, poor Simon of Sari, what an unlucky guy. Just pulled him, roped him, say, you're going to carry his cross. And imagine what he was thinking. You know, am I going to get crucified as well? Where, how is this going to end? You end up in a situation like that, and you're not sure. Oh man, this is not my lucky day. In uh, 1994, I was working in Johannesburg, in South Africa. And it was at the time of transition, and, and the ele democratic elections after Mandela was released. April 94 was the elections. During this time, even though there was a transition from white minority rule to, to a true democracy, uh, what some people may not know, or maybe they are aware, is that there was also a lot of infighting between the, the African political parties and even African tribes. Suddenly there was this vacuum, this new power, and everybody's like, okay, who's going to get the power? And especially uh, between some of the main parties, which were very ethnic, ethnically delineated, uh, Inkata Freedom Party, which was mostly Zulus, and a large part of the ANC, which was uh, Kosa and some other tribes, it became almost like tribal warfare. So I went out for lunch one day uh, in Johannesburg, and I uh, bought my lunch, and as I was walking back to the office, I turned the corner, and down the street came like a whole army, hundreds, maybe even a few thousand, of these uh, traditional Zulu warriors, all dressed up in their uh, traditional clothes with asahais, asahais like a short stabbing spear and shields and pangas and machetes and they were dancing and shouting and I thought okay let me get out of here and I went back with the way I came around the corner and as I turned that corner there was another crowd from another group coming down that street also toy toying and dancing with his peers, and it's like, you know, okay, there's going to be trouble here. And you think like, oh my goodness, this is not my lucky day. 
Lives get interrupted, <coughs> disrupted. This is like what happened with uh, Simon of Cyrene. We think like, what an unlucky guy. We could think, unlucky, bad coincidence. What do you think? Was he lucky or was he unlucky? Well, it seems like he was unlucky, but if we really think about, we don't know where, the, where his story ends. He doesn't say. But these things are in there for a reason. It's written in the Bible. I think he actually ended up seeing the crucifixion of Christ. Because he carried his cross all the way to Golgotha. Where probably he saw Jesus being nailed to the cross, hoisted up. This man that he didn't know, seeing him on the cross saying some profound things. Seeing him taking care of his mother from the cross while he was in agony. Seeing the way he died, the earthquake, the darkness. Seeing all of that. And what seemed possibly to have been an unlucky day, maybe even witnessed the resurrection after that. We do suspect, historians suspect, that his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, became Christians when he went, when he went back. They mentioned in the Bible in Mark 15 and uh, verse 21, I've got it up there, it says, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why, why are they mentioned there? Because the Christians would know, oh, Alexander and Rufus, really? Their dad, he was there. Wow. He became a Christian, and his sons probably also became Christians. Paul sends greetings to Rufus uh, in Romans 16, verse 13. And if we think about it like that, we think like, wow, he was a really lucky guy. What seemed like a, a random event <laughs> turned out to be a very lucky occurrence, disruption to his life. Sometimes we think like, oh, it's luck, or not luck, unlucky. But luck does not really feature in God's plans. The Bible teaches us that God is actively involved in people's lives. Yeah. Yes. Have you ever given that some thought? About, is God actively involved in my life? When life gets disrupted, things happen, life gets interrupted by events, to stop and think, Am I just unlucky, or is God at work here? Right. Mm. Or we think, ah, oh, what a coincidence. That word coincidence I scrapped out of my dictionary. Mm. There are no coincidences. There are only God incidences. Mm -hmm. Because God is always at work. And sometimes we get pulled into situations like Simon of Cyrene, that has nothing to do with us. I think like, why is this happening? Why am I carrying a cross now? Someone else's cross. It may be someone in your family. Someone who falls sick and you have to suddenly take care of them. Maybe someone in the church that needs help. Maybe some random stranger that asks you for something. And you think like, why am I getting pulled into this? I don't ask for this. But if we stop and think, not, oh, am I lucky or unlucky, but is God at work here? It changes our perspective on these God incidents that happens in life. And we don't have to wonder where God is, but realize that all the time God is there working for our good. And I know I sometimes, when things don't go my way, I, I struggle with entitlement. Uh, it's... I grumble, I complain, it's like, no, 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 this is not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, someone said, it seems everybody's mathematicians or engineers or something up here. I'm an engineer as well. I like things organized, planned, you know, and make, to make things work. And with God, it doesn't always work that way, but I, you know, I, like, I start grumbling and complaining when things don't go my way, the way I intended or hoped for it to work out. Do you question God when that happens? You think, why? Why God? Why this? Why that? Why am I so unlucky? I found it's really helpful for myself to take a step back and say, okay, God is clearly at work here in my life. And maybe I'm lucky. Maybe I just need to see the end of this story to realize how lucky I am. You know, as a, if you're a Christian, if you're a faithful, baptized disciple, 
We need to remember that you are the luckiest person in the world. To just imagine that, wow, God has forgiven my sins. He's given me eternal life. How lucky is that? And I did nothing for that. Did nothing to deserve it. Are there some, do we have teens here? Are there teens in the service? Yeah. There's some teens here. Uh, you know, teens, you guys probably grow up in, in church with your parents, and you know, you come to church with your parents. And uh, you know, I grew up in church with my parents, and I thought, I, sometimes I hated it. I think, why do I have to go to church every Sunday? And, and I never realized how lucky I was. How lucky I was to have a foundation of faith. How lucky I was to, to, to get to know and trust the Bible. How lucky I was to have Christian parents who loved each other, who were devoted to each other, who really wanted to make their marriage work, who wanted us to grow, me and my brothers, to, to grow up in a functional family where we are loved, we cared for. I was listening to a debate last night on the radio about the whole thing about civil partnerships and should uh, couples who, who just want to live together, who are not religious at all, should they even get married or have a contract and, uh, and so on. And the statistics were horrendous. Parents who, who actually get married into a civil, any kind of contract marriage situation, uh, something like 85% of, of kids who reach the age of 16 still have their parents together. Kids who grow up in a household where there's no marriage, there's just cohabitation, less than 2% of them reach the age of 16 with their parents still together. The statistics, that's UK, it's in the UK. It was, the statistics, it's just shocking. And, you know, as teens, you guys, should realize how lucky you are to grow up in a Christian household. We had a, uh, last night a, a young man knocked on our door. He's selling stuff door to door. He's, uh, he's in a youth rehabilitation program. He's 20 years old. He just came out of jail. And they gave him this opportunity to, to rebuild his life, to get some skills, to get some references. So he's selling stuff uh, to get some money to pay for his accommodation, food, and to pay for this 16-week uh, program. So I talked to him, it's like, what went wrong? He said, yeah, well, his dad was uh, on drugs, that was all he knew his whole life. And then his dad died, and all that he knew was, oh, well, that's how I can make some money. And he got into drugs, and eventually they caught him, and when he was 18, he went to jail for two years. I'm so sad that He's 20 and his life is already a mess. And to a large extent because of the household that he grew up in. You could say, well, he was just unlucky. But if you grow up in a functional household, just remember how lucky you are. You know, if you're not a disciple yet and you're uh, our guest today, you may think, why am I here today? It may be your lucky day today. <laughs> this may be your chance to say, you know what, let me make a decision to also become one of the luckiest people alive. Mm. To get to know Christ. To have my sins forgiven. To inherit eternal life. To, to get that incredible gift of God. And then you will be a very lucky person. Mm -hmm. There were some other people around the cross. The Roman soldiers. We carry on in Luke 23, verse 32. It says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, 
This he is, the king of the Jews. So how about these Roman soldiers? They just ask himself, am I lucky? Am I lucky today? Well, at least one of them were hoping to be lucky because they were gambling for Jesus' clothes. And of the four of them, one's like, oh man, I hope I'm the lucky one today. And uh, they paid no regard to this guy on the cross who was like, oh, this is the king of the Jews. Uh, they even mocked him, they teased him, and, and they sort of worshipped him. But it wasn't real worship, it was just a joke. Their worship was more like, in, oh, what can I get out of this? Maybe I can get the garment. So they worshipped him from that kind of uh, perspective. It was very superficial worship. You know, we, we see that kind of worship around us, even today, where people don't even realize they're sort of mockingly, just in the way they, 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 they speak, they say, say things like, oh my God, Jesus Christ. I used to, uh, you know, even as, as a curse, I used to have a boss who was an atheist, and I used to tease him every time he said, Jesus Christ. I said, oh, I thought you were an atheist. <laughs> and he says, oh my God. I said, who's this God? I thought you don't believe in God. And eventually he was like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he stopped doing that. Um, but that's not real worship. Real worship is based on what's the inside. These soldiers were worshipping him, worshipping Jesus on the outside. So sort of just saying the right things. But God is concerned about what's on the inside. And it's a bit like when you come through Heathrow, uh, through Customs there. It's a very spiritual place at Customs. I don't know if you've noticed, because they're also more interested on what's on the inside than what's on the outside. When, they, when you bring your bag and they say, uh, can we have a look at your bag? They don't care, they don't mean, can we see if it's a Gucci bag or if it's a Ralph Lauren or whatever. What they mean is they want to see what's on the inside. They don't care if it's brand new or very old or if it's scuffed or if it's uh, expensive or cheap on the outside. They want to see what's inside there. And God also cares about how we look inside. And these soldiers didn't realize that. For them it was all about, hey, who's going to win the undergarment? And one of them did win it. And he thought, I am the lucky guy today. But he never really noticed how lucky he was. He didn't see. Why was he really lucky? And even the other three soldiers. Because Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Their real luck was to be forgiven. Now, sometimes we can go through life looking at the material things. And material blessings to determine if we are lucky or not. And we're so focused on that, that we forget to see what God is actually doing. That we don't notice what He's doing. We don't notice the spiritual blessings that we receive. We don't notice, and we forget sometimes, the forgiveness that we get on a daily basis. Like these soldiers. They were lucky, but for the wrong reasons. They thought they were lucky. One more guy, Barabbas. So we carry on in uh, Luke 23, uh, well not carry on actually, we, we, we go backtrack a little bit to earlier events before the crucifixion in Luke 23 verse 23. This is when they were in front of Pilate, Pontius Pilate, and it says, but, but with loud shouts they insistently demanded that Jesus be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. So here's Barabbas. He's a criminal, sentenced to death. I can just imagine the scene in that prison. Barabbas must have thought, I'm the luckiest man alive. I was going to be crucified, and now I'm getting set free. I mean, I can imagine the other guys in the cell saying to him, Wow, it's your lucky day! Do you think after he got released, he went to go and have a look at Jesus being crucified? I don't know, but I doubt it. I, I probably think he ran as far as he could. <laughs> so let me just get away from here. Yeah, you, don't, you don't think, okay, I'm going to get crucified, 
And then you say, no, well, crucify that guy, and you go and have a look. <laughs> because how long is your luck going to last? He thought he was lucky because he was getting released, but he missed out on seeing the crucifixion. He may have been one of those guys next to Jesus on the cross that were forgiven, but he didn't. He was not lucky. On the other hand, there were two crim criminals, if we move forward to uh, Luke 23 verse 39. Two criminals who were crucified with Jesus. It says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now these two started off in that same prison cell with Barabbas and Jesus. And they probably thought, man... How come he's so lucky? This is my unlucky day. Oh, it could have been me to be lucky like Barabbas being released. I could just see you know, them sitting there in prison and the guards coming and saying, Oh, pick me, pick me! Because he said, you know, free someone else, not Jesus. Oh, pick me, pick me! And then telling Barabbas, Oh, you're so lucky! And you know, Barabbas, Hey, bad luck boys, I'm out of here. One of them at least carried that through and he thought like, oh yeah, great, how unlucky can I be? I don't get released and now I'm getting crucified with a guy who was supposed to save us. And then he was even trying his luck with God, mocking him, saying, come on, save me, save us. But the other one was really lucky. Why? Because his sins were forgiven. Now, as Christians, I think that's, at least for myself, it's a constant challenge for me to keep on looking at life through spiritual eyes. Mm -hmm. Do not get stuck on comparing myself to people around me, comparing myself to the world, comparing myself to the blessings that other people have, uh, what other people are achieving, and to remind myself that in Christ, I am the luckiest person alive. Mm -hmm. And once we realize that, yeah, it changes your life. Because then you can start living a lucky life. You can start living a life where you realize, wow, you know what, all these things, they don't matter. Because in the area where it really matters, I've been so lucky. And you start counting your blessings. You start counting the blessing of having a wonderful wife. 28 years, and we're still together, we still love each other. Having great kids. You know, as parents, sometimes, if you have teenagers, sometimes, you know, my teenagers are like other parents with teenagers. Maybe you're not all like that. I don't want to generalize, but they can sometimes, you know, drive you crazy, drive you up the walls. And then sometimes, Lisa and myself, we, we talk to other parents who are not Christians, and they're like, oh, man, I don't know where my son is. I haven't seen him. I don't know what time he comes back at night. Uh, you know, and when he comes home drunk, and it's this and that. It's like, wow, you know what? We have great kids. We're so lucky to have kids who have principles and values and they want to come home, they want to be with us. If we start looking at through spiritual eyes, we realize how lucky we are. We looked at some men who had some good stories to tell, going through some tough situations in their lives. And sometimes you may feel like this. I think, oh man, I'm so unlucky. God, why is this happening to me? Remember, in Romans says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. In other words, in all things, you are lucky if you're a Christian. Whatever happens to you. It may not feel like it to you, but God is always working in your life. And we just need to take a step back and reflect. If you have a response like the grateful criminal on the cross... And realize that you're a lucky man or a lucky woman. But it's up to us to see that, to realize it. So let me remind you, ask yourself one question, and I hope you get the right answer. 
Tu vai filar.